Have you ever doubted anybody and been wrong? Boy, I sure did. So I'm going to take you back 33 years ago to 1990. I was coaching golf at uh, Concordia Lutheran High School in Tomball, Texas. It gave me something to do between fall football and spring football in May. I took over the golf team. Of course, the kids were better than I was. I was more like the golf babysitter. But in any case, Tomball is up there in that upper left square, about 35 miles northwest of Houston, Texas. Houston is right smack in the center, fourth largest city in the United States. And the league golf match that year, the district golf match, was down in League City, Texas, which is about 30 miles southeast of Tom of, of Houston and so we had this 65 mile trip to take and my principal uh, I was 29 years old by the way and my principal said hey why don't you just drive the kids in the bus okay I had no chauffeur's driver's license no right to be driving this thing I got to school early that morning rumbled around Tom Ball to kind of get a feel of this bad boy loaded those five kids up and off we went down uh, down I-45 toward Houston. Now, if you've ever driven on I-45 in Houston, Texas, it, it's a very strange part of the interstate. It takes these two zags, where you have zigs and zags, you have to slow down to like 45 miles an hour. It cuts right through downtown. It's really a kind of a remarkable part of the interstate there. There's big buildings on both sides of, of you. And the bus breaks down right in downtown Houston, Texas. So I get it pulled over. There, there was an embankment there, as I recall, and there was a pizza hut. So I thought, I got to get down there. I'll get on the pay phone, 1990, no cell phone. Get on the pay phone, call school and say, hey, we need help. Like, these kids are going to be late. I'm stuck in Houston. We still got 30 miles to go. You got to send a taxi or something. So as I'm on the phone with them, one of my golfers comes down and says, uh, Coach Boot, the Secret Service is on our bus with drug dogs. And I was like, What? So I climb back up the embankment, and I see two guys that look like this. Dark suits, shades, earpieces, and for some reason, well, the guy says to me, President Bush is landing at Ellington Air Force Base, just south of here. You have got to get this bus off the freeway. Now, for some strange reason, uh, and I don't even know why today, I thought the kid set me up on candid camera. I kid you not. So I go up to the first guy and I punch him in the chest and go, where are the cameras? And he says to me, son, you lay a finger on me again and you're going to go to jail so fast your head's going to spin. Get this bus off the freeway. It was at that moment that I stopped doubting and believed. <laughs> so I run back down to Pizza Hut. I'm calling the school again, seriously, get a taxi. I mean, and as I'm talking, I kid you not, I see a tow truck called by the Secret Service, hook our bus up and get it off the freeway with our players standing up there with their golf bags on the side of I-45 in Houston, Texas. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but long story short, the school had got a hold of a taxi. It was a uh, big Lincoln Town car, and six of us hopped in with this very large driver with our golf bags and actually got down to League uh, City, Texas in time. I went from doubting Stephen to believing Stephen in seconds as soon as I jacked that Secret Service guy in his chest, and he set me straight. I'm sure each of you can recall an experience in your life where you doubted something or someone only later on then to become a believer in that person. It was three weeks ago today in this very church that our pastor sat up here and exclaimed one of the greatest things we've ever heard in our lives. They said, he is risen. And we responded back with, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, on that very first Easter Sunday night, Jesus had appeared to the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. We're not sure where he was, but he showed up a little bit later, and his disciple friends essentially said the same thing. They said, Thomas, he is risen. But Thomas did not exclaim, he's risen indeed, with the same faith and excitement that you and I would do. And in fact, he said the opposite. He said, you know, I don't believe you guys. Unless I see him, unless I touch him, I don't believe you. And because of that statement, for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years, I don't know who the first pastor was a thousand years ago that stuck the name Doubting Thomas to this guy, but he's been stuck with it ever since, and he's been the butt of punchlines and jokes ever since. Here's a couple of those of you who are Thomas the Train. This is Doubting Thomas the Train. I don't think I can. I don't think I can. I don't think I can. I'll let you read this one. 
Thomas making a statement. We don't call Peter denying Peter or you know, Mark, if you don't know, took his clothes off at one point in the scriptures. And finally, you doubt for one little moment and they never let you forget about it. The reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, and Rev kind of alluded to it in his opening statements, I mean, you and, you and I are similar to Thomas in a lot of ways. In fact, as I would submit that if any of us would have been there on that first Easter, and they said, hey man, you just missed Jesus, I don't think it's a stretch that some of us would have said, I don't believe you, I, j- I just saw him dead on Friday. I-, I have a hard time believing you guys, you're setting me up on this. So that said, I I have always suggested that Thomas really just needs a a good PR guy, right? I mean, this guy gets kind of unfairly labeled over the course of history. First of all, if you go back to last week's sermon that uh, Pastor Bob preached about, when Jesus first appears to those disciples in the upper room, remember, they're scared, they're not confident that Jesus is resurrected, they're afraid of the Jews and what's gonna happen, and Jesus walks in, calms them right away by saying what last week? Peace be with you. And then the next thing he does, it says, he showed the disciples his hands and his side, and it was at that point that it says the disciples were overjoyed. So they too really needed to see the nail prints and the gash in Jesus' side before they became overjoyed and really believed in this thing. So to me, they were doubters too. And then there's this, this little statement. I, I want to go back a couple weeks to John chapter 11 because there was a fascinating statement that Thomas makes in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is the account of Jesus' good friend Lazarus who died. You might remember Jesus ends up bringing him back to life. But, but John chapter 11 is, is that. And Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick and he tells the disciples, hey guys, you know what? We, we got to go back to Judea. And the disciples right away said, are you crazy, Jesus? Last time we were in Judea, they tried to kill you. In fact, there's two sections in John. John 8, 59 and John 10, 31. Two separate accounts where it says, guys were picking up rocks to stone him. And Jesus kind of slid out of there. So so the disciples are worried, like, Jesus, are you crazy? Why would we go back to Judea? There are people there who are looking to kill you. After Jesus says that, though, Thomas says this in John eleven sixteen, 16. Let us go that we may die with him. Let us go that we may die with him. Now, I've talked to two different people who teach Greek in this country, and both of them said, who is him? Let us go that we may die with him. Is him Jesus? If it's Jesus, that's a bold statement of faith. Some of the disciples say, hey, Jesus, we don't want to go back to Judea. And, and, and Thomas says, let us go that we may die with him. You talk about a bold profession of faith. If him, is, if him is Jesus. If him is Lazarus, and honestly, if you read through the context of it, because, um, be, because it's just like two verses earlier that Jesus says, actually, he's dead. That's when Thomas says, let us go die with him. But even, even if he's talking about Lazarus, it gives us an insight into Thomas's brain and how it works. Because Jesus has been speaking metaphorically all through John. He's been telling the disciples, I'm the door. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the light of the world. He's speaking in these allegorical, metaphorical terms. In fact, is in John 11, in the account of Lazarus, Jesus first tells the disciples, said, hey, my buddy's sleeping. He's speaking metaphorically. He's dead, but he says he, he's sleeping. But finally, two verses before John makes that exclamation, Jesus actually says, actually, Lazarus is dead. And then Thomas says, well, let's go die with him. See, Thomas is a literalist. Thomas is not a guy that understands all these metaphors. It doesn't mean he's a dumb guy. But Thomas is a literal guy. And so when he says, well, okay, if he's dead, let us go die with him, which is why Thomas would say, I'm a literalist. I, I got to see the prince. I got to see the gash in his side before I really believe. That's just how God wired his brain. And so that's, that's who Thomas is. He's a literal guy. Anyway, let's get back into our text. John chapter 20. It was on Easter evening that Jesus first appears to the disciples. Thomas isn't there. Thomas comes back a little bit later. And they say, hey man, you just missed him. He goes, unless I see the, you know, stick my fingers in the prints and my hand aside. A week later, now we're the next Sunday. We're a week after Easter. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he says the exact same thing he said to the disciples the week before. Probably so as not to scare them. Hey, peace be with you. It's me. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. 
The question that came to my mind is the one on the screen right now in the last month or so. Is doubt a sin? And so what I did was I, I went to that repository of theological brilliance called Google. And I literally typed in, is doubt a sin? And the very first article that popped up in my search engine, this was the title, Doubt, the Sin That God Hates Most. I was like, holy cow, that's a little stiff. I kept reading, though, and like 98% of the following articles said that doubt is not a sin. So I texted somebody who's actually smarter than Google. I texted Pastor Bob. And I said, Pastor Bob, I'm working on my sermon. I have a simple question for you. Is doubt a sin? And I want to read you what he texted me 30 seconds later. He said, doubt is often that sacred space where faith is challenged yet begins to grow. And then he continued, despair is a sin because that means there's no faith. But doubt is that sacred space where our faith is challenged and often grows. And then I started thinking about... Um, John, uh, Mark chapter 9, that was where this uh, guy whose uh, son was demon-possessed, he came to Jesus and he said, hey, Jesus, if you can help heal my son, that would be cool. And Jesus says, if I can? And then he says to the guy, everything is possible for the one who believes. And do you remember what that gentleman said? He said, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. So he was living in that tension of doubt. I believe, and yet there are times I don't believe. I'm kind of living in that tension. He was actually in that sacred space because his faith was challenged at the time, and then ultimately it grew because Jesus healed his son. You may remember the account of Peter walking on water in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus says, get out of the boat. Everything's cool, right? Matthew's staring right at Jesus. He's walking on the water. It's amazing. And then what happened? It says Matt, or, uh, uh, Peter took his eyes off Jesus, looked at the wind and the wave, and began to sink. And then the next word in the Bible is one of my favorites because it says, immediately, Jesus, right, rescues him. And what did Jesus say to Peter at that point? He said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You of little faith... Peter was in that sacred space. I, I, I think I believe, oh no, I don't believe, right? Just struggling with doubt, can Jesus actually be there for me and can I actually do this under his power? And then finally, and, this, and then I'll get back into our text, Luke 15 and Matthew 18 is the parable of the lost sheep and it says that the shepherd will leave the 99 to go find the one who is lost. That's what I love about our text and the, and the, and the um, sentence that we just read because Jesus, um, right, at, right after Jesus says, peace be with you, it says, then he said to Thomas. See, he goes right to the lost. He doesn't talk to the other guys because they believe. They're not in that sacred space of doubt. They believe. They saw him last week. Now they're seeing him again. But it says immediately Jesus went right to Thomas. He goes, hey, man, put your hands here. Stop, stop doubting and believe. And then when he says stop doubting and believe, there's this kind of gracious and loving command that he gives to Thomas. Thomas answers with, my Lord and my God. Now, Thomas would have known the Old Testament, and in Psalm 35, 23, David actually says essentially those same words. He says, my God and my Lord. But look at what the artist did. Look at the look on his face like, it's you, my Lord and my God. He, he gives this profound theological profession of faith, my Lord and my God. Thomas is acknowledging, you're the one. You're the Christ. You're the promise keeper. You're the Messiah. You're the one who said he was going to do this and, he, and you did it. I believe in you. I trust in you. You shed your blood on a cross 10 days ago. You didn't buy me with perishable things like silver and gold. It was your blood that was spilled, your innocent suffering death that paid the price for me and I believe in you wholeheartedly. Everything rises and falls on your resurrection and I believe it, this powerful statement. I like to say that Thomas moved from this doubt to this shout of deep confessional faith. And then Jesus says to him something neat if you listen to the gospel read just a little bit ago, John 20, 29, he says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. I think Jesus gives us a special blessing. Blessed are you who believe, yet who have not 
seen. See, we're 2,000 years removed from when the gospel account was written. We're 2,000 years removed from when they actually saw Jesus walking around after the resurrection and prior to his ascension. And I think God is giving us this, this special blessing. For Thomas, seeing was believing. For you and me, it's hearing is believing. That, that's how our faith has come. Now, to be sure, we see God working in our lives and the lives of others. We see God answering prayers in our lives and the lives of others. I get that. But we don't see him. We don't see him walking around on the streets. We don't see him in locked upper rooms showing us his hand and his feet, and yet we believe. For some of you here this morning, you probably have never once in your life even thought about doubting Jesus or the resurrection. Good for you. But for many of us, we've probably lived in that sacred space. I, I'm not sure this whole Jesus thing, this whole resurrection thing, I, I, I'm just not sure, right? Maybe you've gone from a 10 to a 7 to an 8 to a 4, and then somebody dies you've been praying for, and you're down to a 1 going, where were you? Why didn't you help, right? We, we ebb and flow. We live in that sacred space. And if that's you, and if that's me in those times, then I will close by reminding you of the six verbs that Jesus said to Thomas when he doubted. Because Jesus knows and understands the fact that we're going to be in these sacred spaces of doubt. And he says to us, put, see, reach, put, stop doubting, and believe. Amen.